you know. So the error and the deliberate, you know, accent, uh, which can be incidental or whatever. Violation, yeah. yes. Your mm -hmm. violation, yeah. Is mm -hmm. it how do we term the violation and how do we do the thing? And uh, especially, you know, can we use the AT20 formula for this? The hazard. What, sorry? Hazard. How can you? How can we use the AT20 to identify many of the errors or many of the uh, hazard, or what do you call this AT20 formula, which you have when you do this uh, investigation? Oh. You mean 80% 80, 80, 80 of uh, accident yeah. due to human errors? Avoid, yeah, yeah, that's right. 8020 formula, you have that for the hazard prioritization. You know, what yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the perspective now on the 8020 uh, formula or, you know, proportion is that we can't really say that uh, we have a clear distinction between purely human factors and I would say other kind of causes. It's very difficult to say, you okay. know, there is a strict boundary. So this is why we don't really believe that we can say that 80% of accidents are due to human errors. Yes. Uh, Thank you. It has, yeah, it has no sense because it's always a combination of human, organizational, technical problems. And so we can say that an accident is only due to human error. So this is why the 80-20, uh, you know, uh, proportion are not are no more used. Okay. Okay. Uh, in terms of time limit, I need to check. It depends, of course, on your investigation process. Of course, the shorter is the better, uh, <laughs> because of course, uh, the the more you take time. Uh, especially when you are doing the data collection, as we'll see uh, later, you know, the more it will be difficult for the people to really uh, uh, remember exactly what happened. And the way they will remember will be very much uh, influenced by their own imagination, you know, or they will be influenced. So the better is the shorter. Uh, of course, you have some uh, regulatory uh, for accident investigation. I don't exactly have it in mind, but uh, I can check. Uh, and what was your other question? Is about uh, blame cul uh, non blame culture or right, right. yeah uh, yeah just culture. After we introduced just the just culture in the safety, many of the airlines even it has been recommended by many experts and many you know committees that you know the just culture should be introduced. That you know if there is an error which occurred or a violation which occurred, if reported, does it affect the investigation process, and how does it affect it? Uh, I'm not sure to understand exactly your point, but um, I would say that, of course, uh, the uh, just culture should be uh, incorporated into the, uh, into the safety investigation. You see, uh, what I mean is that uh, when you are doing your investigation, you should be, of course, always uh, taking into consideration a just culture, meaning that here, you will, and this is also very important for the data collection. When you are collecting your data, you should make very clear uh, for the people who have been involved in the incident or in the investigation that it is based on a just culture approach. Okay, so okay. the two are very much linked. Okay, you can't really do an investigation process, a very efficient one, without. Uh, you know, uh, doing it into uh, into a, a non-blame or just culture uh, perspective. Okay, right. Okay, just that we you can discuss this later tomorrow also. Yes, yeah, that, you know, that's... All, colleagues, all my colleagues yeah, can yeah, be aware yeah. of it. Yes, that's very relevant uh, issues that you are, you are raising here, yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. So let me let me know exactly when you are ready to start. Uh, I'm not sure to see anyone, uh, but uh, yeah, just let me know. Okay. I can finish. I, I can finish my tea. Okay, the main room is ready, but you can finish your tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So I hope uh, that I mean I mean nothing serious uh, uh, happen. Uh, so just to finish on the, uh, you, oh, can you see my screen? Because I'm not sure that, uh, yes. okay. Yeah. okay, very good. So maybe some of you already know the, uh, the famous uh, Rasmussen model, uh, which have been really uh, instrumental to describe the uh, 
uh, errors uh, in terms of uh, the cognitive uh, control that you may have during when when you are doing an error. Okay, so it's also named as a step later model because it, it looks like uh, you know uh, uh, like uh, like a step later, and so. Uh, it describes the fact that when we are faced to uh, uh, an information, what we call a stimulus in psychology, so it activates something, okay? So our brain is activated by seeing or hearing uh, some information, okay? And so from activation, it goes to the interpretation, okay? When we are seeing uh, an information, we, we, of course, we need first to interpret, uh, before making any decision or before making any action, we need to interpret. And this interpretation will be based on knowledge. Okay, we'll try to understand, okay, I see a signal, I see a warning, and I will so interpret this information. And then I will assess what I should do when I'm faced to this situation or faced to this uh, information. So I will define uh, the task, what, I sh what should be done, and then I will choose the procedure, and then I will execute. So you see, all of this process is quite a long process. And very often, in, uh, especially in emergency situation or in a very dynamic situation, you can do all of this. So we need to do some kind of shortcut Okay, and so the shortcut will be from, from identification to procedure choice, and this is thanks to the rule. And so this is why, you, when uh, as an airline, for a pilot or for a cabin crew or for uh, I mean a maintenance engineer, their behavior is based on rules. You know, they are using a set of rules that avoid to go to the knowledge because going to the knowledge takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of time. And so you will go directly from the identification to the procedure charge, which is a very objective of a rule, a procedure. And sometimes you go even, I mean, on a very uh, uh, more uh, faster uh, shortcut from the observation or even from the activation to the execution. And this is what we call the skill based behavior. Okay, when you are driving your car, uh, sometimes when you are seeing, I don't know, the red light, you know that you have to just, you know, uh, break your car, you have to stop uh, your car. And so it goes directly from the activation to the execution. And this is based on skills. Okay, so you see, we have three levels, uh, which is the skill. So this is really based on the uh, very uh, quick actions. This is uh, a kind of reflex, very fast reflex. The rules-based behavior is a decision only based on the identification on a rule, on a procedure, and then we have knowledge. So you see these three levels, there was no one, no, no, none of this level is perfect. They are just adapted to different situations. This knowledge-based behavior is only adapted when you are faced to totally new situation, situations that requires a lot of, you know, understanding, analysis of situation, which have not been really covered by existing procedure. And so here you will you need to use your long-term memory and your knowledge. In most cases, everything can be solved by a rule. And in aviation, of course, we are very used to rules because there is a lot of rules, a lot of procedures. And at the level of the execution, very often we just need to use some skills, very quick execution of uh, one action. So from this model, there is different errors which have been described, okay? So we can have errors at the level of knowledge, we call them knowledge errors. So I'm not using the appropriate knowledge to solve a situation. It might be a rule errors, okay? Uh, meaning that we are not using the good rules for the situation. Uh, or we may have, you know, at the level of the skill-based behavior, we may have what we call slips or lapses, okay? Slips or lapses mean that you are not executing the right actions, okay? This is for slips. Or lapses mean that you, uh, you, um, there is an absence of actions, 
Okay, and so this is an omission. And so this is a model which I've tried to describe all the errors that we that someone can do. And this is very often used also in the investigation process to understand why people did some errors. And of course, the way you will try to manage these errors will be different at these three levels uh, if, it is, if it is a skill errors, a rule errors, or a knowledge errors. Okay, and this is something we will uh, see more information tomorrow morning when we are going to talk about the analysis method. Because when you are using, when you are doing the data analysis, uh, we need to interpret this data, and sometimes we need to use this kind of framework, this kind of description. Okay, so now uh, going uh, in more detail on the investigation uh, methodology. Uh, just to introduce the, uh, this, I would like really to emphasize that uh, any investigation should be based on a scientific approach. Or, you know, an investigation process is very close of what we are using when we are doing science. Okay, um, and so accident investigation and scientific methods they are sharing similar objective or similar approach. The first thing is that it should be it should be based on the model. You know, here we have, in general, when we are, we are doing a safety investigation, we have what we call a, a model of the accident, a theory of accident. Maybe some of you already, uh, already know uh, some models of accident, very famous model of accident. Can you give me one example? So how we can describe an accident? Model. Yeah, a model. You know, what is a model? What is a theory of the accident? A theory of accident is something that describes how accident occurred. Okay? And it helps you to do some prediction. It helps you to do some prediction on how accident may occur. And there is a, some very famous accident model. And I, I'm sure that some of you are already know or even use this model. Swiss cheese model? Exactly, yes. The Swiss cheese model is probably <laughs> the most uh, famous uh, model of accident. And so can you tell me more about the Swiss cheese model? What, what it describe? How it explain an accident? What is the main uh, assumption? If, if, uh, if I understand it correctly, it's more like um, an accident. It's a, it just doesn't take uh, like one single event there are many uh, loopholes that it has to go through in order to uh, for the accident to happen. And if you, for example, like you fill one of that hole and then the accident, would, you could just potentially stop that accident from happening. So just it takes a lot for an accident to happen, not just one single event. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, very, very good uh, description. So uh, here you exactly, and this is why we call it the Swiss cheese model because you know uh, Reason, James, Jim Reason, with the, the author, uh, the father of the model, describe this model as uh, um, the combination of what he call uh, active failures and latent failures, and he describe it as you know holes into. Uh, uh, slice of cheese. Okay, so we'll go back on that tomorrow morning. And but it's a very good example of a model. So when you are doing an investigation, you need to choose a model. This is very important because it will guide you into the data. You can go into the data without having no models. You know, it's exactly when if you come to Paris. And if you come to Paris to, I don't know, to go in a, I don't know, in a specific restaurant in Paris, and if you have no map, no GPS, okay? So your model is a kind of GPS into the data. It will guide you into the data. Then it will help you also to provide hypotheses, you know? And this is exactly what we are using when we are doing a scientific experiment. We always need some hypotheses uh, from the start of the experiment, okay? So hypothesis is based on the model and this describes the uh, very likely effect, okay? I don't know, uh, just to give you a, 
a very easy example. If we are doing a night walk, uh, it is very likely that people will be tired. Okay, so this is an hypothesis, and we need to have some hypotheses. The third thing is data driven. Data driven is also a very important aspect in investigation. Every single thing that you are doing in an investigation should be supported by some data. And uh, this is very important because often people are doing investigation just <laughs> based on their own expectation or their own, you know, uh, thoughts or representation. No. Everything should be, you know, supported by evidence or by data. Okay, so this is also something that is also a key aspect in investigation, as in science. You know, in science, when we are doing, I don't know, uh, science on uh, epidemiology, like uh, you know, studying the COVID nineteen, we need some data really to prove what uh, we believe happened in the uh, uh, pandemic. Then it works backwards. So what, what it means is that, of course, when we are doing an investigation, we are always, you know, working backward from the occurrence to the root causes. And so we are always working after the fact, which is different from what we call a risk assessment, because in risk assessment, we tend to predict what may happen. And very often, of course, these two things work together. Accident investigation will help you to do risk assessment, okay? But risk assessment means that uh, you are not rating something to occur to do the, invest to do the assessment. Uh, and then the last things will be a very important aspect of data analysis. We study the nature of the relationship underlying the data, okay? In investigation, you will collect a lot of data, but at the end, what you want to do is to study how these data are linked, okay? How one data, one, well, how one thing has impacted another thing in your data, okay? So you are studying the relationship underlying the data, and this will be probably the most difficult part of the investigation. And this is why you need to have a model like the Swiss cheese model. You know, again, the, Swiss, the model will help you to understand the relationship underlying, uh, underlying the data. Okay, all clear? Good. Uh, so, as you will see, there is a lot of limitation in the investigative methodology. Uh, uh, limitation means that there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of uh, traps, you know, there is a lot of drawbacks, there is a lot of problems which are associated with any investigative methodology. The first one, and this is probably the most famous, is something that we call the inside bias. Okay, inside bias is something which is a little bit difficult to translate, but it means that this is a trend to select the data that confirm a predefined scenario. Okay, so. In a simple word, what, do, what does it mean? It means that when you are doing your investigation, we tend to have some beliefs, okay? We tend to have some kind of preconception. And so when we are doing our data collection and data analysis, we have a tendency, and this is a very human tendency, to select only the data that will confirm something that we believe from the beginning. And so you see, this is a big error that you can do in an investigation process. Because if you are too much influence in the way you are doing your data uh, investigation, your, your safety investigation, you will go in a, maybe in the wrong direction, okay? So this is why we need to do, uh, to use some techniques, to, to use some skills to avoid, you know, inside bias as much as possible. We can't really suppress totally the inside bias, but this is something that we need to work to avoid that. And so the other limitation is that the way the investigation is conducted, 
is impacted by the skills and background of the investigator. You know, I've been working for uh, doing uh, for a few years with uh, the French uh, investigation board in in France. So they they are doing, of course, accident investigation, and it was very clear that all the investigator in the team have different backgrounds. You know, some are more trained in human factors, some are more trained in I don't know the engines. Some are more trained on the uh, regulatory aspect and so on. And so all this background will tend to influence the way they are doing the investigation. They will have a kind of, uh, you know, personal preference in going in more details on some data uh, for, for which they believe that, you know, are very much uh, in, uh, have contributed to the accident, okay? So this is why we need always to combine data from several sources. And also we need, this is why we need also to apply a very rigorous methodology. We need to apply the process to avoid as much as possible these two limitations. So the hindsight bias and uh, the influence from uh, the investigator, okay? On the second uh, limitation, this is, also, this is also why we need to work as a team. When you are doing, it's very difficult to do an investigation just by yourself, just by, you know, only one people. Why? Because this will be, he will be or she will be very, very much influenced by uh, their background. And so this is why we need, it, it has to be a collective approach. Okay, and this is why also, again, we need to use some uh, methodology uh, for the uh, data analysis. So, uh, the consistency of the data is something which is also key, because as you will get a lot of data, at some point, you need to validate the way you will interpret the data. And so the validation of the investigation conclusion, so uh, what makes you very confident that what you are saying is reflecting uh, the reality, you know, what happened in the accident, is supported by the consistency of the data. So the consistency of the data should, could be based on the converging data. You know, if you have several different sources of data that goes in the same direction, it means that probably your data are consistent, okay? Even if collected at different times, uh, and if they're supporting the same conclusion, it means that your data are probably uh, consistent. Inconsistencies could be caused by deficiencies. It might be in the data, in the way you have uh, collected your data. And so you probably need to improve the way you, you, you have collected your data or in the theory or explanation of the cause of the data. So it, you see, it might be uh, due to the collection, data collection or in the, in, the, in, the, in the way you are using the theory, okay? But still, you always need at some point to validate your own data by comparing different sources of data and seeing how much they are consistent. And this is also something I will explain you in more details this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Okay, so now we are going to describe the process, the investigation process, okay, which is of course the heart of the uh, of this training. So as I told you earlier, there is three main steps in the investigation in any safety investigation. The first is the data collection, of course. Then we have the data analysis, and then we have the report and recommendations. Okay, and so it will, of course, uh, uh, I mean, it will be very, it will be very linked to, um, and you probably know that the Annex 13 that we mentioned uh, at the at the beginning of the training is also describing the final report format. Okay, when you are writing a report uh, based on the Annex 13, you have to follow, you know, several uh, sections and we have to find all of these sections in the report. So first we have the factual information, and this is very important. Even if you are not doing accident investigation, but just incident investigation, it could be a very good idea to follow exactly the same, uh, the same framework. So factual information, the analysis that you are doing of the factual information, your conclusions, 
your safety recommendation and the appendices will uh, include all the data, you know, all the detailed information that have been used for uh, uh, supporting your uh, conclusion and the safety recommendations. So the factual information will cover all the history of the flight, or I mean, of the situation, if uh, if you are working on a on a ground uh, on a ground uh, accident, it will contain the injuries to person, the all the consequences in terms of damage of the aircraft, other damages, all the personal information like the crew age and qualification, the aircraft information, the weather information, the aerodrome information. So you see everything. That, were, that you can describe and which have uh, probably contributed to the event, or maybe not directly contributed, but indirectly contributed to the, uh, uh, to the occurrence, okay? So this is all the factual information that you need to gather. And this information should be described uh, as, uh, as much as possible in a very objective manner. You know, you, you should not interpret uh, this information. Then we get the analysis. And this is very important that your analysis should be based only on factual information. You know, factual information means that you should not interpret too much, you know, things that are not supported by your data. And this is something, this is, I mean, this is a, uh, an effort that you need to do when you are doing your investigation. And this is something uh, we will practice tomorrow, okay? Tomorrow, I will give you some factual information. You will have to analyze the data. And I really want to see that in your conclusion, everything is really supported by data and not just by your own interpretation. So be careful of interpretation of inference, you know, because they, are, they might... Um, put you in the in, in the wrong direction. So only the factual information which is relevant to the determination of conclusion and causes or contributing factors. Okay, and then we have the conclusion. So the conclusion is a list of findings, causes or contributing factors established in the investigation, and so. Uh, the list of causes or contributing factors should include both the immediate and the deeper systemic causes or contributing factors. You remember uh, in, in, in one of my first slides, I show you the, uh, uh, that everything starts from the uh, accident, then we have the human errors or violation, and then we have the antecedent. And so this is what should be provided in your conclusion, you know, the sequence that really explain uh, the link between the causes and the consequences. And then we have the safety recommendation, of course, which is a key aspect of any uh, safety investigation process. You, you can stop only at the conclusion. You need to give uh, or to provide some recommendation as appropriate. There should be, uh, it should be a briefly state uh, any recommendation made for the purpose of accident prevention and identify safety action implemented. So again, here, we should not have any things about uh, blaming someone or identifying, you know, only uh, the responsibility of someone, okay? You need to go uh, deep into your, uh, of course, into the analysis and so provide recommendation. Uh, be careful also sometimes we, we saw some report where the recommendations are not really linked to, I mean, any cause in the investigation, okay? So be careful because it's very important uh, for the quality of the, uh, of the report to have something which is supported by findings, data, and evidence. And then we have the appendices, which include as appropriate, of course, it may depend on the situation, any other information considered necessary for the understanding of the final report. And this is where you will find the factual data, all the data that gives you, you know, uh, that explain why you uh, uh, came to this uh, final conclusion and safety recommendations. Okay, so now, we'll first describe the first step, which is the data collection. 
again, the data collection is a key aspect because if you don't have a good data collection, you can't have a good uh, conclusion. And so you can't have good recommendations. So you need really to be very careful in the data collection. And so, as I told you, it should be a data-driven approach, a data-driven process. So data collection is, of course, a very important aspect. And we have always, and this is the first uh, challenge, is that we have always a kind of selection of data. We, we can't, of course, collect all the data. It's just impossible. So you have to be aware that you are always selecting some data. Okay, And the way you will select the data may influence your final uh, conclusions. So the data collected covers several things. Okay, And today, I will not go in details of the electronic data, because this is not my uh, main expertise. But of course, it might be very important to interpret uh, your, your, your uh, investigation, your, your accident or incident. So it might be flight data monitoring. It can be, of course, cockpit voice recorder when they are accessible. It might be written documentations like company documentation, personal record, training records. And, and I will more focus today on this point, uh, the uh, interview. So interviews is all the data that you will collect with a lot of people, you know, including if, of course, it's possible, uh, the people who have been directly involved in the incident. And so you, we will see that we have different levels. It might be the involved people, the involved operator. So it might be the pilot or the cabin crew. It might be the witnesses. So people who have been um, witness of the incident or the accident. And we have a third category, which, uh, which are the person who are familiar with the system or with the people who have been involved in the uh, incident. It can be the manager, it can be a colleague, it can be even sometimes a family. Okay, So you see, we have three levels of people who have to be uh, at some point involved in the investigation process and, for, uh, and with which we need to collect some uh, um, data through the interviews. So maybe just to make it more practical, uh, here uh, I will use a kind of case study, okay? uh, a use case, uh, which is based on uh, 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 an approach which has been developed by the NTSB, and they develop a very clear process in the data collection to see how much an accident might be uh, due to pilot fatigue or cabin crew fatigue or air traffic controller fatigue. Okay, and so they have described a very clear process. And so I will I will comment the process to see how much you know it's a very um, a very uh, a very rigorous approach to see how much fatigue has contributed to the accident. Okay, so the aim was to determine whether fatigue is a contributing factor because as I told you earlier, fatigue in general is not the direct cause, but more a contributing factor to an accident. So step one is sleep length, okay? When you want to see how much fatigue has contributed, you need to understand or you need to see how much people have slept enough before uh, starting their duty. Okay? Because we know that sleep is a, one of the most highest predictor of fatigue. So we will determine whether the individual has acute or chronic sleep loss. So acute means a very short term, and chronic means long-term fatigue, you know, long-term sleep deprivation, by documenting sleep-wake patterns for at least 72 hours before the accident. And of course, we need to learn about the individual normal sleep habits because we know that we have individual differences. Some people just need four hours of sleep. Some other people need eight or nine hours of sleep. And so, of course, you need always to consider the individual sleep needs, okay, to see how much the, the people who have been involved have been sleep deprived before the, uh, before the duty. So to do that, we need to, as much as possible, interview the individual about their normal sleep-wake pattern and sleep-wake pattern in the last 24 
48 and 72 hours, you know? 48 hours is ideal. If, we, if you get some information for the last 48 hours of sleep is really, uh, this is something which is really predictive, okay? Uh, and for that, we need also to interview sometimes the family members. Uh, sometimes we have been uh, interviewing even the hotel staff because the hotel staff know when, uh, when, when, it's a, when uh, we are in, uh, faced to a pilot or a cabin crew, we know how long they have been staying in the room. And so it helps us to extrapolate how much slept uh, they get before the uh, accident. Uh, eventually other uh, witnesses. So this is the first step, which is a very important aspect. Try to collect as much as possible sleep duration between uh, 24 and 72 hours before the duty where the uh, accident or incident occurred. Then on the second step, uh, because the duty, uh, the sleep quantity is not enough. We need also to see the quality of sleep, okay? Because you may have spent eight hours or nine hours in your bed sleeping, but the quality of sleep might be uh, not so good. And the quality of sleep is also something that will predict your performance. <clears throat> so to do that, you need to interview the people, uh, you know, the people who have been involved, the operators or the family members, if they are accessible, and uh, for that, you should ask them if there was any factors in the environment like noise, light, phone calls, which have interfered with sleep, okay? And so it will, of course, change very much the sleep quality. And if sleep quality is not so good, fatigue will be, uh, might be very high during the duty. And was the sleep pattern was different or disrupted in the days leading to the accident, okay? So the days before the incident or uh, the uh, accident, okay? So second step, it will be about fragmented or disturbed sleep to see, to try to evaluate uh, sleep quality. So to give you an example, uh, I, I've been using the uh, very famous accident, uh, which is the... Uh, an accident which occurred in uh, Guantanamo Bay in uh, Cuba Island. Uh, it occurred in 1993. And so there was a, 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 an accident report which has been written after the accident. And in the um, investigation, they asked to some uh, NASA expert, sleep expert, to do the investigation on sleep and fatigue, okay? And it was the first accident investigation to cite really fatigue as the primary cause. You know, it was even not uh, the uh, uh, contributory factor, but here they really uh, describe fatigue as a primary cause of the accident, okay? And so it was an acute fatigue. And so just to give you some context, uh, in 1993, so, you know, Guantanamo Bay is a, a small US military base on Cuba Island. And so there is a lot of flights going from the US to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, you know, it's a very famous jail now for terrorists, but uh, at this time, there was, it was not a, only a jail, it was a, a military basis. And so there was a lot of flights going from the US to uh, Guantanamo Bay to bring goods, equipment, and so on. And at this time in 1993, there was a, 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 a regulation, a very specific regulation that says that if the aircraft was not having any passengers on board, there was no more flight and duty time limitation for the pilot. So the pilot can fly as long as they, as they want, okay, or as the airlines uh, want it. So here, there was some contract between the military, uh, the, the military, uh, the US military and some American airlines to do some flight from uh, the US to uh, Guantanamo Bay. And so in this specific case, the three, uh, the three uh, crew members, so there was a captain, a first officer, and a flight engineer, they did three consecutive night flights. And at the end of the third night flight, they have been asked to fly from Washington to 
Guantanamo Bay, okay? And so they, have, they suffered from an extended wakefulness period. They did not sleep for the last 19 hours, which is, I mean, in terms of, uh, in terms of physiology, we know that it's a very long period. If you do not sleep for 19 hours or 20 hours, you are very likely to be very tired and to have very low uh, performance. So what they did during the investigation, first, what they did, they determined what was the sleep need for the three crew members. So how do they do that? It's very simple. Uh, the captain and the first officer had eight hours uh, their sleep need is eight hours, okay? So they need to be fully recovered. To fully recover, they need to have every night eight hours. Okay, so they did a, a very simple uh, indicator. We, we call it the sleep rate ratio. So the ratio here for this two crew member is two, because if you divide the, as they need eight hours in a 24 hours, so it means that they, are, they can be awake for 16 hours, and so they divide 16 hours by eight, which means that the ratio is two, okay? So two is a kind of threshold. And every time you are going beyond two, it's, it means sleep deprivation, okay? For the flight engineer, he had a longer sleep need. That means that he needs nine and a half hours every night to recover. So here, the ratio is 14, 30 minutes uh, divided by 9, 30 minutes, which means that this flight engineer has a ratio, a sleep rate ratio of 1.53. And so here you see that the ratio is a little bit lower than for the captain and the first officer. And on this, on this graph, you see they plot, they, uh, they use based on interview, the actual sleep on the last 72 hours. So the accident occurred uh, the uh, 18th of August, uh, 1993. And so they look back at what happened the day before and the day uh, before, okay? And so you see the three curves, the captain, the first engineer, the first officer, and the flight engineer. And it was very clear that before the accident, all of the three curves was uh, higher than their individual threshold, meaning that they were all in a very uh, significant sleep deprivation. So you see, it's a very factual information. It's a very clear evidence that the three crew members were very likely to be tired. It's a first evidence. It's not the only evidence. You will see that we have more evidence after, but it's a first evidence at the step one of your data collection. Then the step three is about the circadian factors. I, I don't know if you are familiar with the circadian factors. Uh, uh, so circadian factor is something that we are studying very much in Wellbees. <clears throat> it's based on what we call our body clock. We know that we are not, we don't have the same performance during all the 24 hours. At some point of the 24 hours, we are programmed to sleep, which is my case now, you know, uh, because it's, uh, <laughs> it's 5.45 in the morning in France. So this is a point normally where I should be in my bed sleeping because my body clock, you know, uh, is programming my body to sleep. And at some other time of, your, of the 24 hours, you are programmed to be very efficient. Your cognitive functions are running very high and so on. So you need to determine what is the circadian factors. And it may change, especially for pilots or cabin crew, because you know that when you are crossing time zone, if you are flying from Vietnam to Paris, your body clock, of course, uh, and your circadian factors will be changed. Okay? Uh, and so we need to identify these circadian factors when we are doing an investigation. This is a very important thing. And very often, I'm very, I'm, I'm surprised to see that very often in the investigation process, uh, the investigator just forget to, to tell what was the time of the accident or the incident. The time of the incident or accident is a very key aspect 
because it will help us to determine the, the circadian factors. Sometimes we can even use what we call a biomathematical model. I'm sorry, it's, a, it's like it's a complex word. It just uh, uh, it describes a software. This is uh, we use this software sometimes in wellbees, uh, especially to do investigation. It's a software that tell you 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 just in the software you input um, the uh, duty time, uh, what was the duty time, how long people have been working, and so on, and the software is telling you how likely is uh, this uh, specific individual to be tired when uh, at the time of the accident okay so it's a kind of software that uh, it's a kind of predictive software that will tell you the probability that someone was tired or not during the time of the accident so it can be very useful to use this model this software when you are doing uh, investigation so here, to go back to the uh, Guantanamo Bay accident, the accident occurred after two night duties. So it was clear that they lost a lot of their uh, sleep, as we have seen on the previous, uh, on one of the previous slides. And the crew member has been awake for an extended period of time, ranging from 19 to 23 hours, uh, so before the accident. So 20 hours, you know, which is uh, between 19 and 23, uh, uh, gives you, uh, there was a lot of studies that tried to do some kind of equivalence between sleep deprivation and blood alcohol concentration. And we all know the effect of blood alcohol, of alcohol, you know, on our performance. And we know that at 20 hours, you have an equivalent of Point eight blood alcohol concentration to have an accident. Okay, you see here that at 19 or 23 hours of sleep deprivation, all the three mem crew members were very likely to have, you know, very um, impaired performance, very poor performance. In terms of their body clock, what have been shown in the investigation is that the three of them obtain sleep at times in opposition to the circadian clock time. Because in the circadian uh, factors, we should not only consider the time where people have been working, but we need also to consider at what time they slept. Because as you all know, we are not programmed to sleep during the daytime. And if we are sleeping during the daytime, the sleep quality will be much poorer than if we are sleeping during the night time. Okay, so this is something also you need to document when you are doing your investigation is what was the time where people have their uh, recovery period when they have their sleep uh, period. And the second factor is that the accident occurred in the afternoon window of physiological sleepiness. So, sorry, it's, 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 it's very complex to describe something which is very easy to understand. You probably notice that you tend to have, to be very sleepy in the afternoon, right or, no, or not? You, you are close to your lunch time and you probably notice that after your lunch, you tend to fall asleep. Do you confirm? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And what, what is the reason for that? Maybe I don't know if you know the reason. Why we tend to, uh, to be very sleepy after the lunch? I think... Sorry. Heavy lunch. Big lunch. Uh, yeah. In fact, a lot of people believe that this is due to the lunch. This is, uh, and so due to the digestion, you know, to the uh, digestion, digestive activity, in fact, not. We are programmed to sleep in the early afternoon from maybe one to four. Our brain is producing something that tend uh, to uh, push us to sleep, okay? And so the, it means that we are really programmed to sleep in the afternoon, uh, uh, in the early afternoon. And so, this explains also why, uh, for, for example, if you are looking to the uh, 
traffic accident, you know, the car accident on the road, you see an increase in the early afternoon. You have more accident in the early, after, uh, in the early afternoon because people tend to be more sleepy and then to, uh, of course, to do more errors uh, when they are driving their car. Okay, so here in the uh, Guantanamo Bay accident cases, it was the two main factors. We have sleep loss factors, they did not sleep enough. And we have also a, a, a circadian factors, they did not sleep at the good time, you know, they sleep during the daytime and the accident occurred in the afternoon. So you, you see, you have a kind of uh, cumulative factors. All these factors have uh, added uh, each other to produce a lot of effects in terms of performance. Then the step number four, you need to look at if we have sleep disorders, health or drug issues, because we know that a lot of people uh, in the general population, including pilots and cabin crew, may have sleep disorder, you know, sleep disorder like uh, insomnia, like uh, apnea syndrome, you know, you probably heard about apnea syndrome, it means that oh, you are stopped breathing during your, uh, during your sleep, and so the quality of your sleep is very bad, and so you are very likely to fall asleep during the daytime. Uh, so, and so the kind of question you need to ask to the people when you are doing the interview is, do you have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep? Here on the first question, you see how much they are likely to have insomnia, because insomnia might be a difficulty to fall asleep or a difficulty to stay asleep. And so just to give you some indication, if people are reporting that they have falling difficulty to fall asleep or staying asleep more than three times every week, okay, we call it, we can call it insomnia, okay? If it occurs only one time uh, every week, it's not insomnia. But if it occurs more than three times every week, we can describe this as an insomnia. And this is a condition that may lead to an accident that you need to consider. Have you ever told the doctor about how you sleep? He saw why, when, and what was the result, you know? Is there, uh, because sometimes when you have really big sleep disorder, you have to talk with your doctors and maybe the, the doctor gives you some drugs or medications, uh, you know, to reduce your sleep disorder. Are you using drugs or medication, not only related to sleep, but and even if you have flu, you know, uh, if you have a flu, you will use some medication. And we know that this, some of this medication may produce more, um, more sleepiness, more fatigue, okay? Uh, do you have any medical concerns that affect sleep, like chronic pain, you know, chronic back pain? This chronic pain may also reduce your sleep quality, okay? And so all of these factors will help you to understand if there was some sleep disorder or some health issue. You sometimes, but it's only for, I mean, for accident investigation, you may even review the operator's toxicological results. So it's only, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, investigation board that are uh, able to do this kind of uh, analysis. And if applicable, have the individual evaluated by a physician who specializes in sleep. This is also for very specific uh, case of accident. Okay, and then the time awake. The time awake is also very important because you may have a very good sleep on the last night, but you, if you spend more than 19, 20 hours of uh, uh, doing your duty, your time awake will also produce a lot of fatigue. So you need to determine how long the uh, pilot or the cabin crew had been awake at the time of the accident using interviews or record to estimate the wake up time for the most recent significant sleep before the accident, okay? So if the accident occurred at, uh, I don't know, 8 p.m., you need to count the number of hours the people have been awake, you know, uh, from the last sleep uh, period. Okay, so if the if the um, if the crew member have been awake at I don't know four in the morning, that means that they have been awake for a total of sixteen hours, and 
when I say insisting hours, it's not uh, randomly because we know that every hours beyond 16 hours start to be a sleep deprivation. Okay, so if you have been awake for more than 16 hours, you are believed to be in a sleep deprivation state. Okay, um, then the stage number five. No, all, all is clear? Yep. Okay, because I, as I can see you, I, I don't know if everything is clear. Don't hesitate if you have questions, of course. Don't worry, we still have. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Okay, so we are close to the to, to your lunch time. Okay, so <laughs> so maybe your your alertness is not so high. <laughs> okay, so no uh, the two last uh, uh, step. The first one is the performance and appearance. You know, performance. You need to use any available evidence to determine if the performance of the crew member was deteriorating prior to the accident. So you need to ask yourself, and you need to find some evidence, did the, the crew member overlook or skip task or part of task? You know, oh, and this is also some indication that the performance was low. Did the operator, so the crew member, focus on one task to the exclusion of more important information. This is also very important uh, symptoms of fatigue. When you are very tired, you tend only to focus on some information and you tend to neglect all the other information. Was there evidence of delayed response to stimuli or unresponsiveness? So what we call the reaction time. You know, the reaction time, if you have very long reaction time, as you will see on the example, uh, on the next slide is also a very good indicator of performance. If you are very tired, you tend to uh, use more time to react. And was there any evidence of impaired decision making or inability to adapt behavior to accommodate new information? You know, the ability to adjust to new information is also a very important aspect of fatigue. When you are very tired, you have a tendency not to be uh, so much flexible, you know, you 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 have the tendency to be uh, uh, to be stick uh, in one behavior and not really be able to change your behavior, as you will see also on the uh, Guantanamo Bay accident. So, what happened in the Guantanamo Bay accident, and it was some evidence of fatigue for the crew member, uh, is uh, just to give you uh, more context when uh, normally the, the pilot should have uh, run uh, on run rate 28, okay? But to um, identify the run rate 28, normally they should identify a strobe light, okay? So the strobe light should uh, guide them onto, uh, on the run rate 28. But on the day of the accident, the strobe light was out of order. It was not working. So they were not able, to, of course, to find the uh, runway uh, 28, um, but they didn't know that the light was uh, out of order. So the captain, who was a pilot flying, decided to use a runway 10 instead of runway 28. But the runway 10 requires a more severe maneuver to complete the landing. Okay, so they have to turn very, uh, very fast before landing on the uh, runway 10. And so the investigator, the investigator, sorry, found that there was a lot of fatigue contribution in their behavior. The first thing is that they did not consider, <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> important information uh, in the decision. You know, when you are making a decision, you, you, you should, of course, use uh, some information before making your decision. For example, the, the fact that they were not familiar with the airport because they are, they, they are, this crew were not going very frequently to uh, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and also their level of fatigue. They did not, in the briefing, you know, they did not really consider that the, the level of fatigue was a, a key aspect. So there was a lack of discussion about the decision to change the runway, which is also a clear uh, factor or a clear symptoms of fatigue. When you are very tired, you don't really want to discuss uh, with your team. You know, we, you, 
you just want to make the decision and you don't really want to discuss. And so there was a misreading of potential outcomes. They did not really anticipate how much this decision may you know, produce some risk. Okay, so all of this was also some evidence of fatigue that all the three crew members was really, were really tired. And finally, and uh, there was also uh, three other factors, the cognitive fixation, the poor communication coordination, and the increased reaction time. So for the cognitive fixation, if you look at the severe, so which is the cockpit voice recorder, so here you have an extract of the transcript of the severe, you see that the captain was totally uh, have a cognitive fixation. He was trying to see or, you know, to identify the strobe light, to, to spot the, the strobe light, but as I told you earlier, the strobe light was not uh, running this day. And you see, where's the strobe? Where's the strobe? So every, I don't know, 10 seconds or every five seconds, he was, you know, he had some communication uh, that really proved that he was totally fixated, you know, uh, over-focused on finding the strobe light. Okay, and so of course, if you are very much focused on one information, you may neglect a lot of very uh, important information. So there was also a poor communication coordination, as I told you on the previous slide. There was no discussion about uh, the fact that they are, they are going to change the runway, that the, the captain has decided to change the runway, and he did not uh, use, you know, the other crew members' uh, view which is, of course, uh, not a good C, uh, CRM uh, behavior. And then we have also a very long reaction. At some point, the aircraft started to stall, and there was a stall warning. So you see it's a very clear warning in the flight deck. And the time to react to the, to the stall warning was also very long. And it's, it's, it has been proved on, uh, with use, uh, using the electronic data from the aircraft. So you see here they use interviews, they use some uh, also electronic data. And from that, they, was, they were able to conclude that really the accident was caused by fatigue. Uh, we can use also, and this is more uh, based on the organization, because of course you need to investigate what happened this day, but you need also to consider all the organizational aspects, like reviewing the general uh, airlines flight time limitation, FTL stands for flight time limitation, or FRMS application. So FRMS stands for fatigue risk management system. And I know that in Vietnam Airlines, you have, of course, a FTL, flight time limitation, but you have also a fatigue risk management system. So you have a documentation that um, gives some policies, some procedures about how you are managing fatigue as a risk in your organization. So you need to review and analyze the FTL flight time limitation prescriptive regulation, because sometimes they might not be very well uh, you know, designed. In the example of the Guantanamo Bay, it was clear. You know, there was a derog the, the, the derogation. You know, I explained to you that uh, uh, the airline was uh, authorized to give uh, to to suppress any flight time limitations, and so in this case, you know, it was not a good regulation. It has contributed to the accident. You need to review the FRMS documentation. You need to review the FRMS process, the data collection analysis. Uh, is the airline is collecting enough data to see how much fatigue is a risk in their operation? And you need to review the fatigue reporting system. You know that in FRMS you have also a fatigue reporting system, I guess that you are using it when you are too much tired, you are probably, you have probably the opportunity to report your fatigue to the, uh, to the airlines. And so you need to, re to, you need to review in the investigation process, how much this uh, reporting system is efficient to collect data on fatigue. Okay, so you see, just to conclude on this morning, you see that uh, uh, so it's the first step of data collection, and it, it, it was just meant to give you some uh, illustration. Uh, the first thing is that it has to be really data driven. And so you see, just to see how much fatigue has contributed, you need to follow a very clear process. 
and to have a, a systematic process. And this is very important because sometimes you will only find what you are looking in, a, in an investigation. If you are not looking to some areas, it is very likely that you will not find any evidence. Okay, So this is why we need to have a clear and a very systematic process to collect the data, to see how much the data are consistent, and then to come to the conclusion. Okay, And so to support that, what we are going to see after the lunch, because I guess this is your lunch time, this is my breakfast time now, uh, it's six in the morning in, in Paris, then after the lunch, we'll see uh, the interview techniques. Okay, An interview, as I told you in my introduction, is a key aspect of any investigation process. Okay, so do we have any question on this first part? Or is everything clear? Yes. Very good. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Philip. Okay, so do we break for uh, one and a half? Correct. Yes, one and a half hour. So one and a half hours. Was it one thirty? We start. So one yes. thirty uh, Vietnamese time. Okay. <laughs> not <laughs> Paris time. It will be not, seven. Not local time in Paris. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So enjoy your lunch. I, I would be very pleased to share the lunch with you because I, I love the Vietnamese food and I miss very much the Vietnamese food. We have lunch.